I want to show you what I think is, is certainly the biggest and one of the strangest fish. This is a fiberglass model of an Atlantic sturgeon. Now this is six feet long and a really huge Atlantic sturgeon might get up to 12 feet long and weigh over 500 pounds. Now I know that these animals look a little bit like sharks, but they're not. They've been around on Earth for at least 100 million years. That means when dinosaurs were out stomping over the land, sturgeon were swimming in the waters at the same time. Now they're covered with these bony plates here called scutes. I've actually got one I can show you here. So they've got this protective armor over them. And if you look at their head for a minute, you can see they've got some these little soft feelers called barbels. That helps the, the sturgeon find food at the, along the bottom of the river. And this mouth here actually comes out like a small vacuum cleaner tube. Um, you might be looking at an image of a related sturgeon, the short-nosed sturgeon that shows that mouth coming right out. They're amazing animals with an incredible life history. Uh, young little sturgeon are born here in the freshwater part of the estuary, where they'll grow for several years feeding on the rich habitats before they go out into the ocean to mature as adults. After many years, sometimes 15 years, the adults will come back into the Hudson to spawn. When they do, we have scientists that are out there studying these rivers with an amazing array of high-tech devices. They use gill nets to catch sturgeon and use several different types of tags. In some cases, it's a sonar tag that allows scientists to track sturgeon and look at the different habitats that they use, correlating those habitats to special maps that we have. A different type of tag is a satellite tag. And this satellite tag is actually affixed to the fin of the fish, and it constantly collects information about the water where that fish is. After about six months, that tag is programmed to automatically detach from the fish, float to the surface of the ocean, where it beams all of its information to our office through a satellite. We have found that sturgeon tagged in the Hudson River have gone as far north as Maine and as far south as Georgia in this incredible long distance migration that they take. Now we love sturgeon. And uh, in fact, worldwide, there's over 20 species of sturgeon. And unfortunately, many of them have been harvested for their meat and for their eggs, which some people call caviar. Luckily, we have a lot of scientists here on the Hudson that are working to bring the magnificent sturgeon uh, back to us in a big way. Now, sturgeon are a native species. They were here when Henry Hudson came up in 1609. They were probably harvested by the Native Americans that lived here, but there are other species that are new to the Hudson River and are causing great changes. Here is our good friend, Lori, again. Wow, hey, Lori, how's it going? Hey, Chris, how you doing? Good, what have you got there for us? Oh, I was diving for Helen. Whew. I found tons of zebra mussels on the rocks down there. Uh, look at these little guys. Yeah. Wow. Oh, man. Now, Ooh. these weren't here in 1609, I'm guessing. No, no, they definitely weren't. Yeah, so what's the big deal with that, that they're here now? Well, these little zebra mussels are filter feeders like other bivalves. Yep. And that means that they eat by sucking in water through a kind of straw-like siphon. Okay. And then they filter out all the edible bits. Okay, all right. And that's kind of a problem in the Hudson because there are so many of these little, little zebra mussels in the river, and they're so good at filtering out all the edible bits that they actually eat too much of the plankton. And gotcha. our native mussels, sure. our native little bivalves, these pearly mussels, don't have enough to eat anymore. Sounds they're like they're almost gone. Sounds like there's pretty big disruptions to the food web. They're definitely a big disruption. Uh, any other any other effects, not to the ecology, but maybe to to, to sort of us as people, d d d you know, directly. Well, there's lots of there's lots of things that can happen in a food web. If you take uh -huh. out any a lot of any one thing, in this case the plankton that the zebra mussels are eating, sure. other things could be affected. Sure. Uh, scientists are finding out, for instance, that other things that used to eat the plankton, like zooplankton are becoming less numerous. Sure. So there's a lot fewer of those. And then it's sort of a cascade effect. And that means that the things that used to eat the zooplankton, like small fish, yep. are also potentially becoming less numerous. There's gotcha. less of those. Gotcha. And that could affect us. Sure. We're we're on that same food web. We are on the we're food all web. connected. That's right. Um, speaking of connections, uh, one of our scientists uh, Helen has been making some interesting connections between zebra mussels and some of the things that might be eating those zebra mussels. Helen, what's going on? Yeah, well, what I'm finding is that something's definitely eating zebra mussels in the river. Um, they, uh, and what we think is 
these guys here, these are blue crabs. Okay. And the, uh, scuba diving in the river for my research every, uh, every week, I find that um, most adults disappear at the end of August, which is exactly the same time that these guys here arrive at Norrie Point uh, during their northward migration from the brackish part of the estuary. Hey, did you, where did, uh, where did the zebra mussels come from, Helen? How did they get here? Well, the zebra mussels come from uh, Eastern Europe and we're pretty sure that they arrived here in ship's ballast. And ballast is the water that big ships take on when they cross oceans to help stabilize them. And together with the water, they also bring microscopic plants and animals as stowaways.